Thank you, Sister Logan. <clears throat> this verse in on John 17, 23 is actually right after John 17, 22. I say that because these are two, two verses are tied together. These verses are, are um, I don't know that you could understand one without the other. L listen to verse 22. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them that they may be one, even as we are one. But what does that mean? Okay, let's look at verse 23. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. See, this is the result of the glory which Christ has given unto his people. In other words, this couldn't happen unless Christ had given us the glory that the Father had given him. Remember, he said, I'll not give my glory to another. So at some point in time, if you're going to be received by God, you have to come out of the category of another and you have to be one with him. Now, if that doesn't happen, it really doesn't make any difference what anybody says. You're not going to stay long with God. You're not even going to want to. The glory. See, this is, this is essential. Now, in the verse that we're going to examine tonight, verse 17, 23, John 17, 23, I'm going to major mostly on I in them. Now, this is what we have to do with mostly right now. Christ in you, the hope of glory. If this, does, if this single thing is not accomplished, then the, the verse is abruptly halted right here. Progress is abruptly halted if Christ isn't in you. Amen. You can't come any closer to God than you can come in Christ. No closer at all. Notice how specific Jesus is in describing our connection to God. I in them and thou in me. Notice how precise that is. Notice he doesn't say, I in them and they in you. Doesn't say that. <laughs> Jesus doesn't say that anywhere. I in them and thou in me. Now see, this salvation's custom tailored for God. And it's custom tailored for men. It's custom tailored for God to be able to possess and at the same time, not destroy. I in them, and thou in me. God's very specific concerning who he dwells in. He's very specific because he's holy. He's holy, holy, holy. Now, the, something, a, a personality like this cannot dwell in the courts of sin. He can't. If he, if he moved in, it would consume the whole place. He's holy. Habakkuk knew this. Habakkuk, that's what he said. Habakkuk 1.13, Thou art a pure eyes to behold iniquity, and canst not look at iniquity. He can't. If he does it, he's going to judge it. It's what's going to happen. So what does God do? God, in his wisdom, he's, in his brilliance, he devises a way that is banished, be not expelled from him. How does he do this? I in them and thou in me. See, it's indirect now. We're working towards, towards the end of the verse, we see, we're working towards a time when they're going to be perfect and entire and wanting nothing. They're going to be in the image of Christ, in the image that God can love, just like he loved Christ. Why? Because Christ has done a work, such a splendid work that they really, really are in the image of Christ. So God isn't excusing anything. God isn't excusing anything in the end and saying, well, I promised I'd love them, so I guess I better get to that. No, Christ is really transforming them into the same image to where when God looks at them, he loves them. He loves them. As he loves his son. Now, now, this is quite a work. This is Jesus' work. I in them. This is Jesus' work. Notice how Habakkuk isn't asking God to shut his eyes. Towards the end of this verse um, in Habakkuk, 
Habakkuk actually is asking God to do something about the situation. Wherefore, now he knows that your, your eyes are so pure that when you look at something, you judge it. So what's he saying? Look at this situation, Lord. <laughs> this is our God now. This is a prophet now. This is what he's asking for. Wherefore, lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devour the man that is more righteous than he? Habakkuk is asking, move in and do some judging when you come in. Amen. Come in and look at, look at the way, that, look, look at the circumstances. Look at it because as soon as you see it, you'll judge it. David said, break their teeth off. Do it. Why? Because he knows God's holy. So he knows that if you can just get God in, in the picture, if he can just move and see what's going on, he'll do something about it. Of course, that may not be good for the, those who aren't in Christ, right? So see, in salvation, God's, God's showing his mercy. He's being merciful. Remember they said, should we call down fire from heaven? Shall we do that? He said, you don't even know what came... Well, this is all about mercy right now. We're living in a time of a merciful. He, salvation's made God be able to be merciful to men, long-suffering, patient. Amen. So this is, you know, this is what we, we, we're inclined to pray good for people. Do them good, Lord. Change them. Let Christ be in them. Because if Christ is in them, now see, they'll start being transformed into an image that God won't curse. Because God won't curse Jesus. Not again. He did it once. He, when he laid sin on him, he cursed him then. Not anymore. He's put away sin. Jesus is revealing something in this verse that will cause great rejoicing when you see it right. Great rejoicing. I in them. Now, you know, there's some people who want to argue with this, and I really don't care. I don't want to argue with them. I want this. I want Jesus to live in me. What rejoicing. This will bubble up in your heart. Some big effervescence of joy will just burst through when you realize that Christ is in me. He's doing something. He's changing me. I'm not what I used to be. And I'm on my way to being what he wants me to be. I in them. Heaven doesn't have a problem with seeing God for who he really is. And you start reading about heaven I tell you, you, get, you want to talk about getting excited. You start getting excited. You start picking out the scriptures and reading about the holy seraphim, what they do and how they see God, how they perceive him. I tell you, you just want to be transported right there. It's like you're right there looking, looking on. It's, Isaiah was given to see the way heaven considers God in Isaiah 6, 1 through 4. Remember this, in the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord. I saw the Lord. I remember we're talking about Christ in you. I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple, and above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another. They talked to each other in heaven. That's what they said. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Well, see, we come together as saints of the Most High God. We like to talk about our God. Amen. We like to talk about. Have you noticed how holy God is? Amen. They talk to me. Tell me about how holy God, because that's the one that's inside of you. The one that's living in you, transforming you. It's a holy God. You would expect his people then to be holy, because they're like him. Amen. And the post of the door was moved at the voice of him that cried. <laughs> Something happened. When you start talking about God, expect things to change because they're going to change. God's, God's a mover. See, God's a creator. He doesn't leave things the same way which he finds it. He judges it. It's never the same. After Jesus moves in, it's never the same. Man, on the other hand, I see you got God on this hand. Now, I'm talking about I in you and thou in me. Now, I want to paint a contrast We've seen that God's holy. God's holy. His eyes are too pure to look on iniquity. God can't be the one to come down here and take away sin. He's going to have to send his son. He's going to, the word's going to have to become flesh. See, that's the means now. God has used these means to bring many sons to glory. Now man, now what, what's man? How's God going to do this with man? Man is born under trouble as the sparks fly upward. 
It says he's shaped in iniquity. By nature, man is dead in trespasses and sins. We know that men walk according to the course of this world. We all had our time. We did our tenure in the flesh. Men walk according to the prince of the power of the air. They have a spirit that is now working in them. And it's causing them to be disobedient. To who? To God. To this holy God. How's God, how Jesus going to move into this? We know that men, primarily, independent from Christ, they walk according to their own fleshly desires. This is what motivates men. Themself. They've made their self to be God. Men are by nature the children of wrath, which means that God is against them. If this doesn't change, they're going to be cast away from his presence. If man's ever going to be able to know and understand God, then a substantial change must occur in the very nature of man. Because the nature of man is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. They can't do anything else but sin. They're the servants of sin. So they need a savior. They need a deliverer. Some that will come and take them out of the pit, rescue them, and set their feet on a solid rock. Amen. See, now how's God going to do this? Well, you know, we, we've come to know that he's done it through the person of Christ Jesus. He's accomplished something that man couldn't do and that God wanted to do. It says God doesn't... He's not like being, if he's going to bring many sons to glory, he has to do this for them. Because they can't do anything for themselves like this. And we know from the scriptures that God has set Jesus as a forerunner. The propitiation, the rock, the way, the truth, and the life. God has set Jesus up as the only man through which he can receive men. Now why, pray tell me, would you want to talk about anybody else when you're talking about a man? This is the man, Christ Jesus. This is the one that God has set up. Remember, he talked about the serpent being lifted up in the wilderness. And if you looked on him, you gazed at him, see, you would be healed. Well, let's lift up Christ. Why would we want to lift up Christ? He's the one. He's the propitiation. I in them. John 14, 6, Thomas said, this is what Jesus said to Thomas. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Now, you know, that sounds pretty clear to me. That sounds like it should end. There is no other way. But when anybody wants to hold up anything other, whether it's psychology or some kind of plan, there's no other way to the Father but by Jesus. Amen. Now, it's a good piece of good news then that he says, I in you. There's no other way for this to be accomplished. When Jesus was sweating, as it were, great drops of blood in the garden, and he said, if there's any other way, this is what he was talking about. There's no other way for men to be saved except Christ die, take away their sins, so he can move in and get the work done from the inside out. Amen. Amen. I and them, and thou and me. Now, Paul knew that if Jesus resides in the house, then the filing influences have to leave. They have to leave. Jesus doesn't let them, let, let them stay, stay around. Jesus isn't like the Israelites when he moved into Canaan. Not at all. The Holy Spirit will move in and he'll make these defiling influences leave. Now, our job is to maintain that. We come into Christ and we have an absolute clean slate before God. We have been saved from the wrath to come. Now what happened? Well, these are influences, they don't stay dormant, do they? They, they? they try to encroach and get their way in some more. Well, what's the remedy? I in you. Now, we know, this is what Paul said in Colossians 1.27. He talked about a specific indwelling. One in which, if you didn't have this, if a man doesn't have this, he doesn't have anything. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. If, if Christ, you can't do what Christ does. Only Christ can do these things. But if he's in the house, 
this work will get done. You see, you know, see this is a, so a brother told me it's a full-time job. It's a full-time job. See, walking by faith, walking in Christ, walking in the Spirit. This is a full-time job. You, will you let your guard down for a second? That old Adamic nature is right there, and it'll express itself every single time. It hadn't gone anywhere. See, you're reigning over it. Actually, you're, someday you're going to be rewarded for your reign over your flesh. Yeah. You were faithful over a few things. You know those evil desires that you suppressed? God noticed it. You suppressed them. And, it, you know, actually it was imputed unto you for righteousness and the, and, the, and the fact that you took the faith and you used it, you employed it to glorify God on the earth. He will keep you. Now, I want to list a few of these things. Now, I've been going through John 17 for a while, and I've been impressed as I did an overview and looked at this, this I in you. This is actually, this is all over the scriptures. I don't have time to go with all. I'm just going to stick to John 17. I in you. What does it mean for Christ to be in you? Are there some benefits? Well, there are eternal benefits to Christ being in you. Now, you, know, you can compare these things like to a new house or maybe to a new car or maybe to, to, to whatever you want to compare them to here, but they, don't, they pale in comparison when you start talking about the effects of Christ being in you. What are some of the benefits? Now, I'm going to just maintain just John 17 benefits. He'll keep you. Now, how important is it for you to be kept? All right, John 17, 12. While I was with them in the world, I hope you caught that. I said something there. Jesus said, while I was with you in the world, what happened, Jesus? While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. That's what I did. Jesus is telling the Father this. When I was with them, I kept them in your name. That's what I did. Jesus didn't say, while, while I was with them, I made them. No, while I was with them, I kept them in your name. How important is that to you? Amen. See, Jesus can't be somewhere and not have an effect. Now, either for good or for bad, it has an effect. Either a man's going to reject him and walk away sorrowful, or they're going to obtain, obtain some eternal benefit from being with Jesus. I kept them in thy name, those that thou gavest me. And you might say, only those that thou gavest me. I've kept, none of them is lost, but the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. Jesus gave the only exception. Yeah. There's no more exceptions. Yeah. There's no more exceptions. Jesus gave it. There's one exception. The son of perdition. Jesus had to be handed over by one of his own. He fulfilled the scriptures, how this must have burdened him. But he did it anyway, because it was according to the scriptures. You can trust Jesus to do things according to the scriptures. And if he's with you, what will he teach you to do things according to the scriptures? Jesus is a keeper. You won't get lost if you're with Jesus. He'll keep you. He'll keep the feet of his saints. He's a keeper. You won't fall if you stay with Jesus. You won't. So why did I fall? I left Jesus. Every time, this is what will happen. If you stay with Jesus, you'll find that all failure is a result of departing from him. You stay with him, he'll keep you. All right. John 17, 14, he'll teach you. How important is it for you to be taught about the Father? I have given them thy word. I have given them thy word. Jesus doesn't use the props of men to instruct those who follow him. See, Jesus doesn't borrow things from humanity. He doesn't. If they've denied, if they've denied themselves and taken up their crosses and followed Jesus, he's faithful, always faithful, to deliver them a word concerning his Father. I've given them your word. I've given them the things that you gave me to give to them. Yeah, Jesus is faithful. So you, stick, you stay with him, and he'll teach you. It means, it means you'll grow. Uh, you'll have a greater understanding of the Father and what he's doing if you stay with Jesus. He's a, he's a teacher. Jesus says, I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Now, Jesus highlights the results associated with following him. You follow with Jesus, 
And you, you, you start getting closer to God. Why? Because God's in Jesus. <laughs> you can't come to Jesus and not hear about God. He tells you he's faithful to highlight God. Remember now, these are only things that Jesus does for those who God has given him. These are the things that Jesus will do. God gives them to Jesus. And what does Jesus do? He keeps them and he teaches them. How about this? John 17, 6. He will manifest or make God to be known unto you. John 17, 6. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. That's what Jesus, God gave them to Jesus. What did Jesus do? He showed them the Father. Jesus is faithful to do this. He'll show them the Father. How, how does Jesus do? I in them. See, he's doing it from the inside. In other words, it's, he changes your desire. You have a desire to learn of the Father. And then, of course, Jesus is quick to manifest his name. Make it known. Now, you can all testify, if you've been walking with Jesus any time at all, that you know more about God today than you did when you first started walking with Jesus. What happened? Jesus manifested his name to you. I love this. It says, thine they were. The whole world belongs to God. The whole world. Every single man or woman or child ever lived belongs to God. And he gave some to Jesus. That's what it says. Thine they were, and thou gavest them to me, and they have kept thy word. I manifested my, your name to them, and they got a hold of it. They wouldn't let it go. They kept it. How important is it for you to keep God's word? How important is it for you to, when you know something about God, to change your life or mold your life around that revelation? Well, if you don't do it, you'll lose it. Because if you don't do it, you really didn't understand it. He will manifest his name. God has given Jesus power to give eternal life to those he has given him. John 17, 2, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, I catch this, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Salvation is exclusive. It's exclusively God. That's what salvation is. God is revealing himself. But see, there's an environment where this revelation is profitable. And that's as you are in Christ more precisely, as he is in you, the hope of glory. And this is life eternal. Like what, what, is, what is it to really live, to experience eternal life? That they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. Now, in other words, the eternal life is an impossibility unless Christ is in you. How will you ever come to the knowledge of God? How will God ever be expounded in your understanding if Christ isn't in you? If he's the, the sole person that can divulge the person of God, well, obviously, it's, it's impossible. Glory be to God. He's, 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 he, these are the effects or the benefits of Christ being in you. Now, as we go through these, you... You, it's like you, you can identify with him. You know you've, you've, you've had Christ open up God to you. You've, you've, you've had God or Christ keep you. This is, this is part of um, being in Christ and Christ being in you. Another thing, he'll give you glory. John 17, 22. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them that they may be one even as we are one. And the confirmation of that work, the confirmation that you, you say, well, how do I know that God's given me, Christ has given me glory? How do I know that? This confirmation in John, the, in John's account, Revelation 21, 9. Now this, this glory, this glo obviously this glory, it's, it's not seen in the, in, it's, it's not physical like this, like this. This glory is going to be seen in its fullness in another time, in another place. 
And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come out hither, and I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. Now, I'm making this point because I'm going to show you if Christ is in you, ultimately, everyone's going to know that Christ was in you. The benefits or the effects of Christ being in you is going to be realized. Not only realized to you along the way, but ultimately, when, 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 when you look at the bride, the lamb's wife, there's going to be a quality about her that is going to be very visible, very, very easily picked out and seen. That's what he said. I'll show you the bride, the lamb's wife. This is your ultimate end if you stay with Jesus now. You stay with Jesus, this glory that was promised, look at what it is. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. What happened? How did this, this one started out as a lost sinner. The way that God found him. He gave him to Jesus. Jesus expounded God. Jesus worked in them, transformed them, and now they have the glory of God. This is Jesus' work. See, this is Jesus. God's going to look at the church and say, well done to his son. Well done. I sent you on this mission, son. Well done. And in fact, it's so well done, I'm going to move right in. I'm going to be pleased to dwell in her. Why? Because Jesus did a work that's absolutely perfect. How'd they get that glory? Jesus did it. Jesus did it. They were, We'll cast our crowns at his feet in acknowledgement. Well done. You, it was you. You brought us here. You gave us this glory. And it did exactly what God wanted it to do. He said, the glory which thou hast given me, I have given them, that they may be one in us. Now, this, this is God. Look at a great salvation he's worked out in the person of Christ. John 17, 22 again. I want to accentuate that they may be one. I'm commenting, I've just commented on a few of these uh, attributes just in John 17 about the well, things that Christ, that you can be benefited by Christ being in you. And it's, it's most remarkable. These, there are so many of these listed in Scripture, if you start looking for them, that all the benefits that Christ bring to the person, in fact, every benefit Every benefit, eternal benefit, is linked to Christ being in you. Well, now, what do you do with the church that Christ isn't in? Well, really, it's not really a church at all. See, it's, it's a, this is just a fallacy. You know, this is Babylon. You know, well, here's just one more to whet your appetite. There's one more. That, that, that he'll bring you where he is. Now, you know, while you're here, and you're here walking this earth, and you're walking by faith, you're walking in the spirit, you're not fulfilling the lust of the flesh, you're doing, Christ is in you, you're on your way to glory, but the fact is you're not there yet. You're on your way. So while you're on your way, you need these kinds, you need these truths to help spur you along, to draw you. See, God can do this. And to just the knowledge that Jesus prayed that you would be where he is, this gives you great confidence. God's not going to leave us here. He's not going to leave us like orphans. He's not. John 17, 24. Father, remember now this is Jesus making a request of his father. This is the one that always pleases his father. Remember? Well, we wouldn't say that Jesus didn't have faith, right? Jesus, he, Jesus had ultimate faith. Now look at this. Jesus is making a request, a desire. And he's asking his father, fulfill this for me, Father. Father, I will. Now, have you ever wondered what Jesus' will is for your life? Here it is. This is it. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Father, I'm asking for this single thing, that your eternal purpose would be accomplished. You see, Jesus didn't at the last minute decide to do the Father's will. Jesus came with this intense desire to do the Father's will. And right here what he's asking is exactly what God's doing. He's bringing many sons of glory. Because so now if you ask anything according to the will of God, 
you'll get the thing you ask for. Jesus is asking for this. This is right at the center of the will, and it's right at the center of Jesus' will. This is, this is what I want, Jesus is saying, that the ones you've given me, they will be with me. Well, you know, there's not anything else that can satisfy like this. This is the hope of glory. And if Jesus is in you, he's creating an intense desire for this very thing to come about. To where on that day, when you stand with him in white, it won't be a shock. This will be a fulfillment of this hope that's been building in you for your whole life with Jesus. In fact, anything less than that, you wouldn't be satisfied with it. You've got to stand with him in white. This is what you, we, our great desire. Now you can judge yourself. How these things stack up. We, we, if we judge ourselves, we would not be judged, right? So you can judge yourself. How much, how much do I want to stand with Jesus in white? How much will I give up for that? Because there are some things along the way that have to be shed. Remember, he said, cast aside the sin and the weight that thus will easily beset you. Get it off and run with endurance. Why? Because we're headed towards this glorious end. Why? Because Jesus is in you. See, it's my argument that only the ones that Jesus is in has this hope. I in them. Who is it then? Who's the them? I mean, it would behoove us. This is like the greatest question we could ever ask ourselves. Do you know you're one of his? Ultimately, as we have amply rehearsed in John 17, Jesus is referring to those who his father has given him. Those are the ones that he's saving. Amen. How do you know that God's given you to Jesus? Well, it would behoove us to know. Well, I would consider this to be the most important question any, in any person's life. The most important, don't take another step till this is resolved. Am I walking by faith? Do I know who Jesus is? Well, for anyone to leave this question unanswered, or, or just to bypass it and say, well, no one can really be sure. I've actually heard this. Someone said, no one can really be sure until the end. God has given us sufficient revelation to judge ourselves on this matter. Now, Jesus opens the door for faith when he prayed, neither I pray for these alone, but for them. For who? For them. Also, which shall believe me, but get this, believe me through their word. And now the apostles, they went out preaching Christ everywhere, right? They preached the gospel to the whole world. This message has gone out. The question is, is do you believe the record that God's given of his son? And if you have, then you've been, see, <laughs> you're, you're one of God's. You're one of the ones that he gave to Jesus. The songwriter said, if you, if you from sin are longing to be free, look to the Lamb of God. Jesus is revealing the only way that God could bring salvation to men. This is the only way. He's holy. See, he's too pure to come down and do this work. So he sent his son. Jesus came and he subjected himself to unmeasurable sorrow. And he did it. He took away sin. And now he's seated at God's right hand and he's expediting the kingdom. He's bringing many sons to glory. And he's doing it in that one way. I in them, and thou in me. The gods, couldn't think of a better way to say this, but I'll just say it, and maybe I'll come up with something better. God's like, Jesus is God, God's, God's buffer. See, he, God is too holy to come down and dwell in you in the fullness now. But Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Now he says, that they'll come and they'll, they'll make his abode in us. How exactly does God make his abode in you? I'm, I'm saying that Jesus is saying, I in you and thou in me. That God is dwelling in you through the person of Jesus. Who is dwelling in you through the person of the Holy Spirit. See, this it, it's a perfect plan. In other words, it's a plan that works. It's a plan that will actually bring you from the pit of sin to the courts of heaven. This is God. And look at the salvation that he's wrought. Jesus is revealing the only way 
The only way that God could bring salvation to man. Jesus would later pray in the garden, If thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will. Now, this same kind of, the same kind of desire, the same kind of, 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 of determination, Jesus works in every one of the sons that God give him. God gives him a person, and you'll find yourself, you walk with Christ, you'll find yourself saying, not my will, but thy will be done. What happened? See, this is Jesus in you, and he's transformed. Your desires are different. Jesus submitted to what was, in his own estimation, the most horrific event that any man could possibly endure. He was going to be separated from his father. Now, how, how hard is that for someone who's never been separated from his father? But Jesus submitted to it. He endured it. Now, for a moment, for a short time, you are separated from him. Now, you have him in the spirit. You have him, but see, you are still separated from him. You have to walk by faith, not by sight. But, brother, there's coming a time when this is going to all go away. Amen. And you're going to see him face to face. Jesus is getting you ready for that moment Amen. right now. Amen. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, see, if that Christ isn't in you, there is no hope of it being glorious when you see God. Amen. What could possibly persuade Jesus to submit to such an arduous task as laying down his life? He's the prince of life. He wanted to please God. It's what he said. We don't have to gamble at the answer. Jesus said, not my will, but thy will. I'll lay down my life, Father. I'll do it. And he did it. Now he's asking us. Christ is in you. What's one of the effects? You'll lay down your life. Now I'm, I have to submit this, that if you're not laying down your life, Christ isn't in you. Jesus said, unless you take up your cross, deny yourself, and take up your cross and follow after me, you can't be my disciple. Now, see, that's, that's not just at the front door. That's all the way to glory. Amen. See, you're giving Jesus the front seat. Why? Because he's the one that's, that's bringing you to glory. Well, as I was thinking about this, it's not by coincidence coincidence that Adam fell in a garden. And it's also not by coincidence that Jesus overcame in a garden. See, the very thing that Adam just couldn't seem to do is say, no, I'm not going to do what I want to do. I'm going to do what God wants. It's the very thing that Jesus overcame in, didn't he? He said, not my will. No, I won't eat of the forbidden fruit. I won't. I'm going to submit to God. I'm going to do what he said. And see, he overcame. He actually, the second Adam, actually overcame and made a new and a living way where now the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead can dwell in you and can quicken your mortal body. Why? Because Christ is in you. So in other words, his effects, his desires, his hope will be in you as well. When he moves in, he doesn't just take a part. He takes the whole thing or he doesn't have anything to do with it at all. Nevertheless, not my will. This is what it says. For even Christ pleased not himself. Romans 15, 3. Christ chose not to do his own desires, but the desires of the Father. Now, if he's in you, you'll start manifesting the same kind of attitude, if I can say it that way. The same hope, the same desires will be cultured in you by Christ. Why? Because that's pleasing to the Father. And he's making you perfect. Now, perfect, another way of thinking about perfect, is complete. See, he's, he's bringing you to a, to a place of completion to where you're not lacking in any attribute that God desires. Or the, another way you could say it, that God requires. God's perfect. God's holy. Jesus is bringing you, he's making you perfect. Now, there's a sense in which he made you perfect when you first came in. But see, there's quite another sense in that you need to be made perfect. It's an ongoing work. Philippians 2.6 says, Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Now notice the humility of Jesus. So if Jesus is in you, 
what do you think is going to work in you? You're going to start, you're going to start finding that you actually prefer the brethren. You actually put their interests above your own. And on the occasion, when you, you notice the conflict, praise God that you notice the conflict. See, there, there's something, this is not right. I don't normally choose my own benefit here. Why is this happening? How could you even come to those conclusions? Because Christ is in you. See, he's changed your nature. You really do want to please God. He took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, you know, we can't claim to have, to have come down from some great height like Jesus came down. We actually were at the lowest you could possibly be, and he brought us up. This whole thing for us has been an upward progress. We're seeing more and more of God, have greater hope, greater desire. And eternally, eternally we're going to be greatly benefited because Christ was in us. Amen. We see that Jesus chooses to accomplish the will of his Father, and now he's working in us to make those same choices. See, I say these things because we're living in an economy, spiritual economy, where it doesn't make any difference what your choices are. Is that there's a gospel that's being hawked out there that it doesn't really matter what you do. Christ did it all, and he just accepts you the way you are. But the fact is, is that Jesus couldn't say this word, these words, if that were true. I and them, and thou and me, that they may be made perfect in one. It's what Jesus is doing this work. There's no other way for God to dwell in man. Now, I, I suggest that in the ages to come, Christ will be the reason that we can dwell in the presence of God. So much so that if Christ were to leave, we'd have to go with him. Now, we, the, this, I, don't, I couldn't find any place in Scripture where we're not directly associated or linked with Christ in any dealings with God. Amen. You take Christ out of the picture, you remove him from glory, and we have to leave the courts of heaven too. Well, our association is built on the foundation of the work of Christ. He's our representative. He's the one that, that is the lamb in the midst of the throne. And he's the one that's giving us or giving, imputing to us eternal life. This is what he promised. Now, Jesus promised this, Revelation 3.21, to him that overcometh, it's a word from the king now, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne, you're going to be seated with Christ in his throne. Now, if he's ever dethroned, you're dethroned too. See, uh, now, I'm, I know these are hypotheticals. I know that Christ isn't ever going to be dethroned. I'm trying to emphasize that your identity with God is through Christ. And because of that, see, the, 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 God's established this in the scriptures. And, and, and in our minds, see, now, if that's the truth, then Christ, if, 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 it, if salvation or getting us made perfect is Christ's work, he's not going to have any defective people. And see, Christ isn't going to offer up a church that's fundamentally flawed. It's not going to happen because Christ has done a perfect work. He's, he's made us perfect. He's making us. Notice that in, in, Ver, in Revelation 3.21 and John 17.23, Jesus is very careful how he expresses this truth about the person of God. He says, I in them, in John 17, Revelation, he says, sit with me. He says, thou in me, in John 17, he says, am set down with my Father. See, this is, this is not just a technicality. God's in you through or by the person of Christ. And see, this is the way it, I'm not saying anybody here would think otherwise, but see, it helped me to understand this. This is, how is God, how is God be, be able, because some people say God can't dwell in you, you'd blow up. Well, that's foolish. Christ is in you. We, we prove that. I in them and thou in me. 
So see, God's worked it out. God's worked out to where he can maintain his holiness, his, his justness, his uprightness, and at the same time be, be in you. <laughs> how, how, how only God could do this. Amen. I and them. The result of them being in Jesus is that they're found in the end perfect and entire and wanting nothing. They're actually without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Jesus can take them and deliver the kingdom back up to the Father and not have a red face. He really did. They're, they're just like me, Father. They're perfect. Oh, only Jesus can do this. We know that it wasn't by works of righteousness. Well, how was it then? It was through Jesus Christ, our Savior. He did all the work. Fundamentally, he did all the salvational work. That being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Made perfect. He's accomplished something. He's completed something. He's consummated something. And it's the church. See, in the aggregate, it's the body of Christ. Christ is perfectly, it's perfect and entire of course, right now we're on our way there. We're not there yet. But see, in the mind of God, it's like a done deal. In the mind of God, when he gave the work to Christ, he knew what, what he would get from that. He entrusted this work to, to one that would, uh, was already perfect and that would make <coughs> these things perfect. Well, I thank the Lord for, um, for the things in John 17, for this prayer. You know, this was... This, Jesus shared with us his prayer to his Father. And this prayer is so rich with, with wonderful um, um, things from God. It shows Christ's desire, shows Christ's inclination, not only to do the will of the Father, but, but to, to, for his people. I mean, God, he knows God. He knows, he knows what, 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 what God loves, and he knows what God hates. And see, there's not going to be anybody on the, on the last day that is fundamentally flawed that God loves. See, this is just foolish. God loved us and he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Why did he do that? Because he knew what Christ would do with those that he gave them. Christ would make them lovely. See, Jesus, God isn't, isn't pretending. He, God isn't looking at someone. In fact, I just encountered this today with somebody who, this is what they think. They think, well, fundamentally, Jesus died, and he took away sin, and now you, you can't help but sin. But God overlooks it because of what Jesus did. Now, is that really what salvation is? See, it's not. Jesus really, him being in you has really changed you. And, and for me, this, this, is, this is life from the dead. When you see what Christ is, is capable of doing in a person, well, now you start asking for different things. Christ, if you could just, if you could just look at it, if you could just move in and do something, Christ will do it. Christ, if, uh, I'll make this exception. If God's given you to the Father, if the Father's given you to Christ. Now, see, that's our job. I, I think that that um, falls into our purview to make your calling and election sure. To see, this is not something that's assumed. This is something that's apprehended. Anyway, I thank God for this. Thank you, brother.